You're listening to Behind the Wheels with Doug Mason, Dave Walters, and Mike Yeagley. This is a show where we talk about heavy truck and medium-duty axolands. Doug, Dave, and Mike bring close to 100 years of experience and expertise in the transportation business. Join us once a month to learn new things about axolands. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Wheels. I'm Mike Yeagley. I'm Doug Mason. And I'm Dave Walters. I've been looking forward to this show. Uh, We're going to be talking about axle end problems, about how to troubleshoot wheel end failures. But today we're going to be focusing mostly, pretty much exclusively probably, on the hub. And, you know, the kinds of things that can go wrong with the hub and the kinds of things that have changed. The industry is changing dramatically. Every component in the vehicle is in a just huge flux. And the hub is also, over the past 10, 20 years especially, there's been a lot that has changed with the axle end and with the hub. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking a little bit about that and about how you can troubleshoot what, when you know something's going wrong with your hub and what you can do, what you can change in your maintenance processes to make sure that that you don't go down those roads in the future. I think we should start off with uh, maybe, Mike, just some of the things that are maybe warning signs or, or something that is uh, occurring in your wheel and that might give you an indication that you're starting to have issues. And, and some of those things might be uh, wheel noise or vibration a wheel wobble. Obviously, if you have anything smoking or anything like that could be an issue. And also just if if things are getting overheated, I mean, the the hub cover could be hot to the touch, could be having wheel lockup. It could be uh, increased stopping distances. And so when you start having stuff like that or even abnormal tire wear, maybe a good time to start taking a look at your wheel end to see if there is a concern. When you start having those kinds of things go wrong with your your axle end, you things get a little bit hot, you have one axle end that's getting hot, you know, unusually hot. We're going to be focusing today on hubs, and it may be the hub, but it may be a, just a bunch of other things. Uh, you could have brake problems. You could have, we could go on and on. The scope of that discussion is a little bit big for just this one episode. So we'll be having this kinds of discussion, this, these troubleshooting discussions over the course of several episodes, just peppered in with the with the rest of our shows. Let's talk a little bit about that, Dave. What are the kinds of things that you see in the field when, when a hub starts going sideways on you? The big thing that's really changed in the hubs is most of them are preset hubs now. And preset hubs um, has really changed the industry because now the original equipment set the preset on them. So, you know, when they're installed, the mechanic's really not adjusting them. So that's done really well for issues as far as bearings go. And then the use of synthetic lube has really helped that. So what we used to think was bearing issues, wheel seal issues, those are are a lot better. But on the same breath, when you have a preset hub and it's been an industry practice to hammer in studs and hammer out studs. You don't want to really be hammering on uh, a preset hub type of thing. So, you know, your practices kind of have to change as technology comes more and more prevalent in our industry. Dave, what would you see? Let's say someone did go ahead and they've, they're running preset hubs and their practice, you know, is to pound them in and out. What would you expect them to see? from that what kind of issues is that going to do there's a couple issues that i've seen and one is you could actually um you know when you're beating the studs in and out if you don't hit the studs square like especially when you're installing them and you hit them on one side or the other and you put a burr that doesn't really seat properly and when it doesn't seat properly as you tighten up the joint you run the truck and you have a place where it can basically come loose. So you have basically then stud issues, stud breaking. I'm very involved in TMC and TMC, you know, wrote a practice of, you know, pressing studs in and out. There's mm-hmm. many manufacturers that make tools that actually can pull the studs in and push them back out. So you're not beating on these you know, pretty sophisticated hubs now with the presets. And you don't, you don't want to screw up 
this bearing loads and the presets and the wheel seals, you know, so pressing the studs in and out has become what we all want to see in the industry where it used to be standard practice of beating them in and beating them out. So if you do beat them in and out relative to the hub, are you saying that you could mess up the seals and start getting a leak then or your your preset set up and you're going to start getting a, a wobble or something like that? You could. I mean, those are great possibilities where, you know, back in the days of the non-preset hubs, it was very common to do that. But, it, you know, the more and more you understand of the sophistication of these products, you know, an aluminum hubs in the, the market is a gigantic player and you really don't want to be beating on them aluminum hubs like they did with the old steel hub. So right. a lot of things have changed and, you know, I'll bring up that, you know, the studs are basically the springs that, you know, they stretch every time to hold the wheels on. We've talked about that in many episodes. When these guys go to buy studs, if they don't know and buy reparable studs, they can have a lot of problems down the road. Yeah, you got to make sure you get 10.9s, as we've said many times before, and a quality stud makes all the difference relative to making sure you have the correct tension in the joint uh, so that you do not have any potential loose wheels or, or loss of wheel, obviously. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing that you see in hubs now is they'll have like a, uh, like a squealer band on them. And I've even seen cases where that, that, that squealer band got warped to the point where it was kind of like acting brakes. And then you have really the brake issue, but it was caused by the squealer band activating the sensor. So, mm -hmm. you know, people's got to understand there's sensors for many things in the axle end now where, you know, at one time there was zero sensors in the axle ends. And right now, you know, the tire pressure monitoring systems there, uh, you know, the brake systems are there with sensors. So it's, it's becoming a lot more electronic than what it ever was in the past. And there's some temperature sensors in place now, now too as well, right? Absolutely. And when I go out in the field and you got heat issues, you try to explain to somebody, I was just talking to a major fleet and I said, you know, the, the tire starts melting about 290. 400 degrees, the wheels can be affected. The hubs are, are a little bit, you know, when you go out and you see a hub that's definitely been overheated, it could be 500, 550 degrees. So each part of the system has its own little part where it can be affected by heat. So knowing which components and what heat they can take is a very big thing. That's why these sensors are becoming more and more important. I was reading, I'm not real experienced in the lubes, but I, I think that they run around 325 or something like that. 350 is where the lubes typically end up. Do you know that? Yeah, the lubes and the synthetic lubes are very good. You know, you know, I come from the days of packing wheel bearings and putting them in there and the grease didn't have the higher temperatures like these synthetic lubes. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about bearings, you know, M Mike brought it up earlier. Uh, a few years we were having a little trouble with uh, the wide base wheels in the market and with the different offsets and you know when you really got into the deep dive of that the true brutal issue was if you didn't have the bearings there were some offshore bearings that was causing a lot of problems in our industry put it that way yeah, I was uh, I was deeply involved with that project, and uh, uh, Meritor has a great white paper on bearings on their website just for free download to try and educate the public about what to look for in bearings, how you can tell a good bearing from a bad bearing uh, when you're in the purchasing. I strongly advise anybody to take a look at that. It's a, They did a lot of work and made it available to everybody. So I learned a lot about bearings. And But that was, you're exactly right, Dave. It was, uh, you know, if you bought real high quality name brand bearings, that wide base problem didn't show up. Nobody saw it. You know, you could have, you know, a high offset wide base wheel without any problem. So it took a long time to chase that down, but that was certainly one of the more interesting projects I've worked on in my life. Every day when you go out and people will say, 
the PN spindle, they call them PNs, the PN spindles with the, with the uh, tapered bearings tended not to have any issues and, and the other end handle was much more affected by that. So there was a lot of things going on in the, the that and the life of, of that at that time. You know, Dave, one of the things yeah. that you're always uh, always telling us and reminding us, uh, especially in these times right now, is that when you do have an issue and you do have a, a failure of some type, how important it is to really be like a, a forensic uh, investigator. Make sure you save all of the evidence, take uh, as many pictures and not just of the actual failed component, but all adjacent components, uh, specifically if people can't get out to review them. You were saying that in some of the instances uh, recently, you've had to diagnose things over the uh, over the internet rather than going in person. You want to give us a little detail on that? You know, I'm telling everybody right now because of the COVID and what we've gone through, uh, diagnosing pieces and failures are a lot different. Uh, you know, years ago, every time you had a major issue, you know, you'd send somebody out there to look over all the pieces and parts and tell you what happened. Uh, Really, because of so many things that's going on, like us not being able to cross, you know, the border and, you know, even to Canada right now, that's a major issue. So what I tell everybody is get as many pictures as you can of every wheel end part that comes in conjunction with the part you think that failed and make sure that you kind of get a history of everything because what you're finding is these people are, you know, their driver might be at the scene and he'll say, you know, I don't know what really happened. I went in to eat and I really didn't look at any of this stuff. Well, get as many pictures as you can from somebody there or from the company who's doing your work and save the pieces, have the pieces sent back. Because once those pieces are destroyed, you really can't reenact what happened. So all we're trying to do is if you ask somebody like us to come out and look at all these things, if you have the pieces I'm very confident we can piece together a great story for you, but we really can if we don't have the pieces. Photos are good, but the pieces are even better. You know, try to save your pieces and parts. And people say, well, I don't want to ship them in from someplace. Well, the shipping cost might be the cheapest thing to diagnose an issue. Uh, and I'll give you an example. There was a trailer builder, and he was having some issues with overeating took pictures. We really didn't take pictures of the brake drum or any of that. Once he got the pieces back and I got to go to their facility, it was a brake issue. And what they were doing was uh, the trailer brake handle. They were actually uh, storing all the keys to their loads on <laughs> that trailer brake and it was activating it and heating it up. <laughs> so, I mean, when you get into these problems, you know, you have the wheel, you got the hubs, and this was with disc brakes too, which was, you know, becoming more and more prevalent. As you're deep diving into some of these troubleshootings, once you get the pieces back, it really tells a great sign of what happened and how it happened. So for you people that drive the trucks or own trucks or in the maintenance, get the pieces back and we can probably piece together the story. Now, Dave, you, you talked know, one of the things, kind of the preset, uh, and you talked about lubes and studs. What would be the next item that you would want to bring up as a, a concern or a common issue? Like I said, the wheel seals has always been an issue of leaking, but really that has become probably really, really improvement in my time frame in the industry. I mean, that used to be where the wheel seal was leaking and you lost your lube, the bearing heated up, and... The wheel seals have really improved. I mean, that to me is that. What I see when you get into the hubs right now, you know, one of the, the big issues is still seating that brake drum on that hub. There's a little lip where, you know, that brake drum is seated. And if it's not cleaned and properly seated, you're going to have some major issues. And I was just on another diagnosis of a wheel and Viva, the computer, and they did not get the drum seated properly and those wheels come loose pretty quick and cause major damage. You know, we were talking a little bit before we, we went on 
and we were talking about the heat. And one of the things, the story you told me, uh, you told us during that was somebody had changed their friction, their, their pads, their brake pads, and that friction material change caused a dramatic increase in axle end heat. And it got me thinking about the importance of, you know, we're talking about the importance of having the pictures and have a lot you know, all the information about what happened. But it's also valuable to have good information about what was there before, have that history. If you have the history of what parts were in place previously, then that might also come into play. Absolutely. I try to tell everybody a truck or a trailer from an original equipment manufacturer. Most of the time, the pieces and parts that they assemble, they know what they're doing. And all of a sudden, you you say, well, I'm going to change friction material. Was that friction material going to cause you to stop faster or is it cheaper or what's, it's all kind of like, why did they start out with this type of friction material? But I, I think I'm going to change to another one. And it really can cause you dramatic heat issues, especially in the markets that you're starting and stopping a lot. The refuge hauling is probably the most stop and start. So when those guys change friction material, city buses stop and go all the time. When they change friction material, it can really affect it. So we used to go out there and do a lot of heat studies, put actual little sensors, or they're not sensors, they're like heat strips on them, and then we could tell what kind of temperature you're getting. And I remember being out with one of the engineers from one of the tire companies, and he's like, guys, every time you change that, the window of what melts the tire bead and what doesn't, that's really something to know. Understand what type of friction material you've got and what you're putting on, and especially your type of industry. As I've talked to customers, people will ask me, well, how hot can a wheel get? My first answer is always, if you're not melting the tire, you're not damaging the wheel. The tire is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to wheel tire system. And it's a lot of these things that you're talking about with the increase of heat. You'll see it in the tire, you know, sometimes, depending on what we're talking about. And what, but like the hub, especially hub and wheel, you know, that's going to show up in the tire pretty quickly. Is that what you see, Dave? As I would always tell somebody, whatever the quote unquote weakest link in tires melt before, you know, which it affects the wheel and affects the hub and affects the drum. So that's where you're going to see it probably first. And people will say, well, how can that all be related? Well, when you get into a wheel end, everything is kind of related. So that's kind of why you want to do this troubleshooting of a wheel end. You might not even think the brake would affect the tire, but it, it does. There's instances where you just don't relate that. I always go back to studs because studs and cap nuts are such an important part of the system and people just take them for granted and they are so important and buying quality fasteners and quality cap nuts and properly oiling them and doing the right practices are critical and people will say, oh, I've done it that way forever. Well. Folks, the world has changed and oversee parts or counterfeit parts are part of our society. And you better understand that. Right. So, Dave, is there anything else? You know, just really, we've tried to focus, uh, we've drifted off a little bit into the brakes, but we've tried to focus on, on the hubs. Is there anything else with the hubs? And I, actually, the one thing I did want to ask you is that we talked briefly about the synthetic lube and how good that is. Have you seen any downside to the change to the synthetic loop? The downsides to the fleets is the cost of it. Every time I always tell somebody, if your only downsides of a product is the cost of it, that's okay. That's really the downside. So I've seen a lot less wheel seal leakage. I guess what I'm saying is, from my perspective, the downsides is the cost of it. Okay. Well, is there any other items we need to talk about, Dave, with the hub? No, I believe we're just kind of given the highlights of what might happen or what type of failure might. And like you said, a lot of times it's caused by something else, but you kind of have to piece all this together as a whole wheel and just not a wheel issue or a tire issue. You might have to deep dive more into the wheel end. 
And I guess the key uh, we always say is uh, prevent it before it happens. So there are a number of walk around inspections you do uh, when you are going out for the day or for, for the week, whatever it might be, and monthly, quarterly, all these things. There's plenty of things the uh, OEM manufacturers give information on to check, confirm issues before they get too bad. And so I guess we would always say, you know, be safe, do those checks, make sure that you catch the error before it happens. But if something does occur, like you said, Dave, we need the parts and the pictures to be able to diagnose really what's going on. All right. Well, I think that does it for this episode of Behind the Wheels. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation, manufacturing, and technology. Inventing the first forged aluminum wheel in 1948, its team of experts continue to develop the most lightweight, efficient, and high-performing commercial vehicle aluminum wheel products. Bringing you revolutionary innovations like Alcoa Durabright wheels, Alcoa Durablack wheels, the new Alcoa wheels hubboard technology, and the lightest truck wheel on the market, Alcoa Ultra One 22 and a half by eight and a quarter wheel. Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation.